Okay, this is the first of our chapter 11 videos where we're going to look at the structure, physical properties, and reactions of benzene derivatives. All right, so first what we're going to look at here is a little bit of a historical uh, background on benzene. It's a very interesting story, okay? All right, so benzene, it has this formula, C6H6. Obviously, if we only have six carbons and, and uh, if we have six carbons and only six hydrogens, we're dealing with a very unsaturated molecule. Remember that an alkane would be CnH2n plus 2. So there is a lot of unsaturation in something that has this formula. Okay? All right, so in the 19th century, you could tell what the formula for benzene was, uh, but you didn't have uh, spectra or anything like that, so you had to characterize it by its reactivity. And it was very puzzling to people back then, the fact that you have this very unsaturated molecule, and you start reacting it with some of the reagents that alkenes react with, like bromine here. And what you find here is that there, at room temperature, there is no reaction between benzene and bromine. You have to actually add a Lewis acid catalyst, a very common one, common one is iron tribromide, okay? But when you do this reaction, you don't get the uh, bromine addition product like you see here. You don't get anything that has the formula C6H6Br2. You get a substitution product. You get C, uh, the product where one of the hydrogens has been replaced by bromine, and you get HBr as a byproduct. So clearly, the reactivity is very different from alkenes. Okay? Hydrogenation occurs only under extreme pressures of hydrogen, and it requires special catalysts. All right, so this is the structure that Kekulé said that is benzene, and it's still the structure today, okay? All right, so Kekulé said that he had a dream where he, snakes were chasing their tails and came up with this structure for benzene. I uh, read a History of Science article where it said that Kekulé was trying to dodge someone else's proposal of a similar structure and uh, came up with the dream idea so he didn't have to reference the other person. I do not know what the real story here is, but it's kind of a fascinating story. Uh, benzene, very puzzling to the ancients because, or the, not the ancients, but uh, very puzzling to early organic chemists because it defied the reactions expected for unsaturated compounds. All right, so that's the structure of benzene. It has these alternating double and single bonds in a six-membered ring. Why would it not show alkene-like reactivity. So what was proposed is that there's really strong resonance stabilization. So here's a resonance structure you can write where you just switch the position of the uh, double bonds and single bonds. All right, and you can do that because here's the structure of uh, benzene right here. Okay, and let's just imagine that uh, we're going to take any two adjacent pi bonds and make them into a, pair them up. All right, so let's say that here's a pi bond. Here's a pi bond. And here is our last pi bond. All right, so imagine that you're this p orbital right here. How do you know that you're bonded to this one and not bonded to that one? Okay. So this is where this extreme resonance idea comes from, okay? All right, and it's thought that uh, the resonance, that we can demonstrate this resonance energy by drawing this resonance hybrid right here, a hexagon with a circle inside of it. And this is uh, the way you'll very frequently see benzene written. I always say, write benzene this way if you want to write a reaction mechanism. Uh, which we'll be doing in chapters uh, 11 and 12. Uh, draw benzene this way if you want to understand its spectral properties, which we'll be doing in chapter 13. 
All right. So let's look at some of the consequences of this resonance. What we find here is that every CC bond is exactly the same length in benzene. It's 1.4 angstroms. All right, recall that a single bond is 1.54, a double bond is 1.32, so this is somewhere in between. It's like each bond, each CC bond in benzene is kind of a one and a half bond if you want to look at it that way. All right, some other ways we can look at this resonance energy, or we're going to quant we can quantify it by looking at heat of hydrogenation data. All right, so here is cyclohexene. Its heat of hydrogenation is 120. Here's 1,3-cyclohexadiene. It, its heat of hydrogenation is 231. It's not quite twice what... Uh, cyclohexene is, and this is because of the added stability of a conjugated alkene, which we looked at in the previous chapter. This is, uh, recall, or understand that this is adding two moles of hydrogen, not, not just one mole. All right, so we're going to add three moles of hydrogen to benzene to get cyclohexane, and we might say, okay, 120, 230, some number around 360. But what we find is it's not really very exothermic at all. It's un unexpectedly has a very low heat of hydrogenation. And this suggests that there's some ex added stability associated with having three bonds in this alternating double and single bond arrangement. Okay. All right, so if we just take a linear uh, uh, thing here, we're going to say that uh, this uh, should be 240. This uh, should be 360. Uh, if we use 120 as our base value, okay, okay again, conjugation stabilizes it a little, but this benzene ring arrangement right here stabilizes it an awful lot. All right, so this stabilization of um, the benzene ring, we're going to refer to as aromaticity, okay? Aromaticity or aromatic stabilization is worth about 150 kilojoules per mole. This is the uh, biggest stabilizing influence or stabilizing factor you've seen in this class to date. All right, let's compare it with some other things. Like um, if we compare isomeric free radicals where one is primary and one is tertiary. The difference is only about 10 kilojoules per mole. If we look at uh, a monosubstituted versus a trisubstituted alkene, their energy difference is only about 12 kilojoules per mole. All right, so aromaticity, we can say, is huge stabilizing influence. It outdoes virtually everything we, or outdoes every stabilizing factor that we've seen to date. Okay. All right. So uh, we can have multiple benzene rings fused together, and these are called polynuclear aromatics. All right. So this is naphthalene. This is C, uh, C10H8. Recall that benzene was uh, C6H6. All right. Three, uh, okay, so when we draw multiple benzene rings fused together, here's an important point to remember, that the better resonance form has the maximum number of benzene rings. All right, so this resonance form on the left here we're going to say is better because when we look to identify benzene rings, we can find two of them. Never mind the fact that this double bond is depicted in the left ring. Uh, that's just an artistic representation that has nothing to do with where the actual double bond is. There's two benzene rings. All right. So in this one, 
there's a benzene ring here, but if we look at this ring right here, it's uh, not a benzene. Okay. So this is not going to be quite as stable. Okay. All right, so the better resonance form has the maximum number of benzene rings. All right, let's fuse three benzene rings together. Here's anthracene, and it's C14H10. Now, in anthracene, you cannot make all of your rings benzene rings. So here we have two benzenes, and we have one that's uh, not benzene. All right, we can write a resonance structure, but again, we can never put more than two benzene rings in anthracene. There's one, but this ring's not a benzene, and that ring's not a benzene, okay? So the resonance structures on the left would be better because it's got uh, more benzene rings, but uh, we still can't make every benzene ring a benzene ring. All right, that's not the only way we can fuse three benzene rings together. We can also have phenanthrene, which is what we call angu angularly, angularly fused. An all-benzene resonance form is possible for anthracene. It's also C14H10. All right, notice that as we fuse more and more benzene rings together, the carbon to hydrogen ratio is increasing. Uh, is we're getting more carbon atoms per hydrogen atom, or less hydrogen atoms per carbon atom, if you want to look at it that way. C6H6, okay, goes to C10H8, C14H10. All right, here's, so we're going to see this trend go on as we fuse more and more of them together. Uh, here's four benzene rings together, and these are C418H12. All right, so here's a problem for you. Put in the double bonds for these benzene rings so that you have the maximum number of benzene rings. Draw the most stable aromatic form you can draw for each compound. All right, so in the top one, we can write an all-benzene structure, okay? Here, like, if you look at benzene, 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 benzene. In the bottom one, we cannot write an all-benzene structure, but we can get three out of four of the benzene rings as benzene rings. And here, you see that we have three benzene rings, and the last one is not. Okay. All right. The top one uh, is more stable because you can draw an all-benzene ring form for that one. And uh, that's a general consideration, okay? Or that's a general trend that the more benzene rings you can write, the more stable it is. All right. Here's a compound with uh, five benzene rings fused together. Notice that it's becoming more and more carbon rich as we fuse more and more of these together. This is benzoapyrene. It has a distinction, distinct place in organic chemistry. It's the first organic compound discovered to be carcinogenic. So chimney sweeps in London were developing testicular cancer at a very high rate, and it was traced back to this one compound, benzoapyrene, which is a byproduct of incomplete combustion, which uh, if you watch wood burn, you see all the smoke. The smoke is, is the uh, various organic compounds that haven't converted all the way to CO2 and water. And many of those compounds are polynuclear aromatic compounds. This one is a particular, particularly nasty one. Okay, here's a graphite, and when we uh, fuse an infinite number of benzene rings together, of course, our formula is carbon without hydrogen. This is an allotrope of carbon. Okay, so the other common allotrope that you see in nature is diamonds, which is all uh, sp3 carbon. So the only difference between graphite and diamond really is the hybridization. You could give someone a graphite pendant or something like that and tell them it's chemically or uh, its molecular formula is the same as a diamond but uh, it's not of course 
Oh, the only difference is hybridization. And many of you may have seen the uh, cartoon where Superman squeezes the hell out of a lump of coal and turns it into a diamond. And that, of course, does make sense because uh, the graphite here will have kind of a, a layered shape or a, a, you can get more carbons uh, in a tighter space with uh, with graphite. Okay, sorry, or with diamond rather. Okay, so uh, you have stronger CC bonds in diamond than you do in graphite. So uh, you squeeze the hell out of graphite and it turns the sp2s into sp3s. I think that's how diamonds are made in uh, geology. All right, so here's uh, we're going to look a little bit at some nomenclature issues here and. For lack of a better thing to tell you, uh, these structures here are so common that you're just going to have to memorize their common names, okay? All right, so methylbenzene is called toluene. Halogenated benzenes, like with X is chlorine, it'll be chlorobenzene. We just call it the, the halobenzene derivative. With an OH group, it's called phenol. With a carboxylic acid, it's called benzoic acid. With a nitro group, it's called nitrobenzene. With an amine group, NH2, it's called aniline. And with an OCH3, it's called anisole. We will use all of these compounds in the next chapter when we talk about substitution of the benzene ring. And uh, these are going to be very good demonstration compounds. If you remember from the uh, previous chapter, some of these have electron donating groups, some of them have electron withdrawing groups, and we're going to see how that figures very big in the uh, reactions in the next chapter. Okay, here's another common nomenclature issue. Disubstituted benzenes, okay? In the common system, we're going to use uh, the term ortho to refer to what is in the IUPAC, the 1-2 substitution. The 1, 3 substitution in IUPAC is referred to as meta, abbreviated M, and the 1, 4 disubstitution is para, abbreviated P. These common names uh, are used so much for the disubstituted benzenes that uh, we have to remember them, okay? All right, so examples here. Uh, the compound that you see here, and it's a uh, common name would be paranitrobenzoic acid, but in its IUPAC name, it will be 4-nitrobenzoic acid. This is meta-iodoaniline or 3-iodoaniline. All right, when we have more than two substituents on the benzene ring, orthomatopara doesn't work anymore. So we have to, we have to go to the IUPAC system. So this is 2-3-6-trichloroanisole. Uh, we name benzene rings exactly the way we name cycloalkanes, okay? Uh, we're just going to name them as the derivative of the parent benzene structure. All right, another nomenclature, <coughs> excuse me, nomenclature point. All right, as a substituent, the benzene ring here is, a, is called a phenyl ring, abbreviated PH, sometimes abbreviated C6H5, and in some of the older systems, you'll sometimes see it abbreviated that way. Benzene with a CH2 group is a benzyl, which is abbreviated BN. So it's important to remember the distinction between a phenyl and a benzyl. If you're just thinking benzene, benzyl, this is probably what you would think of, but this is what benzyl officially means. So this is a nomenclature point that you have to remember. All right, we're gonna look at various reactions here. In chapter 11, we're going to emphasize reactions where the benzene ring is a substituent. How does it affect some of the other reactions we've already seen? In chapter 12, we're going to deal with reactions that occur at the benzene ring. All right, so the first reaction we're going to look at is called side chain oxidation. We will not go through the mechanism for this reaction. This is one where you just need to memorize the equation. All right, 
So when we treat the benzene ring uh, where we have uh, benzylic hydrogens, okay, so this is a benzylic hydrogen, hydrogen at the benzylic position. What we find is that the side chain gets completely oxidized. The CH3 group here in this case is going to turn into a carboxylic acid, a benzoic acid derivative. Two sets of reagents will do this. There's chromium in a high oxidation state here or manganese in a high oxidation state. Either of these reagents are effective for doing this transformation. What's interesting about this transformation is that any carbon-carbon bonds you have at the benzylic position also get cleaved, all right? So this compound here, where we have a propyl group, is also going to turn into the carboxylic acid. This bond that I've shown here gets uh, cleaved under these conditions. All right, so the side chain oxidation proceeds for any compound that has benzylic hydrogens. Okay, get one. This is one where we're not going to go through the mechanism. It's somewhat complex, but it's uh, used to sort of tell you the substitution pattern on your benzene ring. All right, in living systems, uh, they don't use these uh, transition metals in high oxidation state. We use an in, uh, cytochrome P450. Let's remember to spell cytochrome correctly. Cytochrome, yeah, cytochrome. Okay, P450 with various enzymes and oxygen do this reaction very effectively. All right, this is one of the reasons why benzene is a very toxic compound, but toluene uh, is uh, much less toxicity. Uh, and this is because there is an oxidation pathway available to toluene that is not available to benzene. When benzene gets oxidized by these cytochrome enzymes, it starts turning the double bonds into epoxides, and those serve as strong alkylating agents. You'll uh, understand that more in more uh, more deeply when we talk about the chemistry of epoxides in a future chapter. Okay, but because of this relatively facile oxidation, substituted benzenes tend to be less toxic than benzene itself. All right, we're going to predict the product of each reaction. All right, so let's look at the top one. Uh, the chlorines are not affected. The ethyl group, uh, we're going to cleave this carbon-carbon bond right there. We're going to oxidize the ethyl group all the way to a carboxylic acid. Okay. All right, the next one. When we have a tertiary butyl group, remember what a tertiary butyl group is, okay? So let's put R there for that one. Okay. What you notice here is that there are no benzylic hydrogens. All right, so the T-butyl group is not going to be affected by this reagent. You may say C600, H1201, which isomer are we, are we talking about? Well, it doesn't matter because you have benzylic hydrogens, and this is going to be your product, product plus a mystery compound that probably has uh, 600 carbons in it, possibly the carboxylic acid. In the next one, uh, we also have benzylic hydrogens in the structure. Okay, so there we go right there. And what we're going to find is that this one is similarly oxidized away, and that's converted to the uh, dicarboxylic acid that you see there.
All right, here we have a carboxylic acid already. It's just going to remain throughout the reaction. Here we have a, a group with benzylic hydrogens, another alkyl group with benzylic hydrogens, yet another one, and another one still. And we find that as a result of this process, we're going to get this naphthalene derivative with four carbox, five carboxylic acid groups on it. All right, we're going to end this reaction here, and the next reactions we're going to look at are actually reactions you've already had before. We're just going to see what putting a benzene ring structure into the compound does to some of those reactions.